And you are on the platform. Thank you for being with us. And uh, we are sharing interesting, controversial, sometimes difficult views and talking about the issues, the zeitgeist of the day and the things affecting us. Uh, well, as you know, I have a love-hate relationship with the anti-vax community. Um, they love to hate me and I just love them back. Um, and we have had some quite interesting exchanges on Twitter and indeed on the radio. I think you would have listened to Angry Andrea this week. Yesterday we said had Angela who told us she had caught COVID from the COVID vaccine and then she provided her medical records which said quite the opposite and that she had some mild side effects from the vaccine. But if I have been sent it once, I have been sent it 400 times. A documentary which the anti-vax nutters are now using as their new, I don't know, tablet of stone. It's called Died Suddenly. And it features in a very small part the New Zealand, um, unregistered New Zealand undertaker Brenton Faithful, who has, I understand, been touring the country with a bunch of clots. Um, trying to convince you all there's some massive conspiracy going on. Um, so many people sent me the, um, the died suddenly and told me to do my research that I, uh, I pointedly didn't watch it. I sort of skipped through it and I saw the first five minutes and that just told me instinctually all I needed to know about this piece of so-called journalism by some shock jock in America. But I then read online what I thought were some very worthy and far more thoughtful critiques of Died Suddenly and the sort of propaganda it represents. Uh, so I thought the best thing we could do is get the authors of one of those pieces, which I considered the best, um, who takes apart Died Suddenly, and I think explains in pretty straightforward terms why you mustn't believe this stuff. You can share it if you want, you can watch it if you want, but believing it and believing what it says is another thing entirely. So joining us from um, McGill University, where he is a science communicator, is uh, Jonathan Jerry. Jonathan, welcome to the platform. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, what's uh, look? Just because I know I've already had people in the announcing that you're coming on. People have said just the following things, and I want to get them out the way. McGill University is funded by Bill and, Bill, and, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, so you are part of some grand conspiracy. Is that right? <laughs> I've heard that one, yes, indeed. Okay, do they provide... It's not true, but I have heard this argument. It's not true. So what happens is that people don't understand that we have a ton of researchers on campus, yeah. and these researchers will apply for grants, and some researchers somewhere on campus got a grant from the Bill and Melinda, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I suspect that people think that that means that men in black parachute onto campus, knock on every door, and hand everybody talking points. That's not how funding works. All right, and it's not. And thank you. I'm sorry, we have to go through it because I know that I'm going to sure. get an avalanche of texts and emails on this. What is a science <laughs> sure. communicator? What are your, your qualifications? Tell us a bit about yourself. So I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. I have a master's degree in molecular biology. I've worked in cancer research, cancer diagnostics, in forensic biology, and in low vision rehabilitation research. I started to do science communication on the side as a hobby for many years. And now this is what I do for a living. I've been doing it for something like five years, four, four to five years. Um, at McGill University, we have a very unique office, which is called the Office for Science and Society. We're not part of the, of the PR arm of the university, so no, no, not public relations. What we do is we answer uh, uh, the public's questions that they have about science. We try to make sense of science and we try to separate also sense from nonsense because as you know, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Ooh, is there ever? Um, all right, let's 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 deal with the documentary now. Died Suddenly. Apparently was going to answer all our questions, explain the great conspiracy. And it is based, uh, I mean, at the very start of COVID, it was all that Pfizer had the biggest lawsuit in history against them, which of course uh, wasn't true. But right now things seem to have pivoted to there are a whole lot of people dying after having the vaccine. And given that in our country, 95% of the adult population is vaccinated and some of them are going to die, that is going to happen. Um, but they're dying and undertakers, funeral home directors, are finding strange rubbery blood clots. And this all goes to prove that it's part of a conspiracy to depopulate the world through a dangerous vaccine. That's fundamentally what the movie says, isn't it? 
Basically, yes. And and it, it paints this on a canvas that is so large. It, it's a spiritual battle between the forces of good and evil. So it's no longer just about opposing the pharmaceutical industry. Now it really is about these are evil satanic forces and we are the, the army of light that needs to stand up to them. All right. In the movie, I understand there are a number of people who supposedly have collapsed and died after having the vaccine. You have done an analysis of this, I understand. Yeah. Um, so this this document, I mean, we're going we're gonna to call it a documentary, but yeah. there's always air quotes around this word. Um, it shows there's there's a montage there that is very, very emotionally um, impactful, where we see a bunch of people usually usually captured on, on these uh, uh, security camera footage, um, just falling to the ground. And we are it is inferred that they have died and it is inferred that they have died from the vaccine. And uh, different people have managed to sort of track down where these videos come from. And it turns out that a lot of these people are not even dead. Uh, some of them uh, had fainting episodes, so often what is called syncope. So they have a, a drop in blood pressure yeah, yeah, and all yeah. of a sudden they yeah. faint. And if, you know, if, if they're standing up, you know, so this is going to happen to one in five of us over our lifetime. So it's a very, very common occurrence. And because there are cameras everywhere now, you're going to capture a lot of fainting episodes. Uh, there are people having seizures uh, on camera, which is, again, something that happens naturally. And some of these uh, clips that are being shown in the movie, they predate the COVID vaccine, sometimes even predate COVID itself. But they are used to make us think that, look at all these people just dropping dead and nobody is noticing. And, and this is just, it's a lie. Like these videos are not, there's one, uh, one particular example where there's a, a young basketball player who faints on the court and again, it is implied that he has died of the vaccine. Um, this was tracked down, and this this particular uh, athlete uh, had a fainting episode on the court in December 2020, early December 2020, before the vaccines were rolled out. And he is just fine. I mean, he just signed on with another team. Like, he's very much alive. So these are just lies. Okay. The other issue is the rubbery blood clots. And we've got our own purveyor of lies about this, a guy called Brenton Faithful in New Zealand, and he is, I think, makes a short mm. appearance in the documentary. This seems to be a global phenomenon. Truth-speaking, independent undertakers who are seeing things that the mainstream doctors are either suppressing or just missing. Have you had a look into yeah, that this issue? Is this, this is interesting because the, there's a lot of footage of these clots and it is meant to be repugnant and revulsive. Uh, it, it really is all about this emotional response. Um, but uh, people who are in the business, I'm not an embalmer, but there are embalmers who have looked at this movie and said, no, these are perfectly normal. I mean, first of all, there are clots that happen before we die. So some people unfortunately die of a clot. This does happen. And then there are clots that happen after death, post-mortem clots. Uh, and a lot of what is what we see in that in this movie seem to be, according to these embalmers, these postmortem clots, and they happen. Uh, and and the, the reason why there might be a, a spike in in their numbers, and we don't know because there's no database tracking these things. The reason might be because of COVID. There was such a surge in people dying of COVID at, at the beginning of the pandemic that bodies were were lined up in 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 in, in embalmers' offices, and they had to be refrigerated for a long time. And that causes and that clots. contributes. Yeah. And that contributes to these clots. The, the, the blood starts to coagulate and the solid, uh, uh, the cells and, and the platelets, they start to go out of the liquid phase and it creates these clots. Yeah. And for anybody who is really genuinely interested, who is open-minded and wants to learn more about these clots, there was a fantastic article that was published on science-based medicine, I believe it was a, a week ago, by Benjamin Schmidt, uh, who is an embalmer and who takes us through the kinds of clots that you see as an embalmer. And it's extremely well done. But this is exactly what I find particularly ironic because a lot of people in the anti-vaccine movement will tell you, do your own research. But the thing is that when you do your own research and you speak to actual experts, this is where the claims made by Diet suddenly, they fall apart because mm. they are not factual. They're just lies with an emotional valence and they're meant to disgust you and they're meant to frighten you. Yeah, it is a fear. It really is playing with the fear. Well, look, interestingly enough, I interviewed Brenton Faithful, which, and he probably didn't get the interview that he thought he would. And he began by telling me a story about a perfectly, embalming the body of a perfectly healthy New Zealander who had died two weeks after having the vax and really his family were quite concerned and everything. And he went on and told the story. And I said, is that it? He finished. And then I simply asked him the question, how old was this person? 92. 
<laughs> yeah. And from that point on, oh, I good. knew that this was a deliberate deception. And I wonder, what? and look, what I loved about your article was, you do point out that this is about, in a time of fear and uncertainty, appealing to people's emotions, making them feel uncertain and giving them this beautifully wrapped up in a bow conspiracy theory that explains why they're right and uh, they are lucky enough to be one of the few who have the answers to the mysteries and problems of the universe. Um, and you also said it's not good enough to call these people nutters. And I've got to say, as someone who's been involved in media a long time, I have got to the point where I'm just bloody angry back at them for their stupidity. And I'll have to admit, my rhetoric and I guess my tone has become more aggressive. I like the way in your article you suggested that despite the human emotion that gets me there, that's not the answer here to get rid of these lies. What, what, what I yeah, what, what I often like to remind people of is that, yes, there are people who are anti-vaccine. They are, I mean, we have seen some COVID-19 specific anti-vaxxers during the pandemic. So people who do not want the COVID vaccine, they think that it is you know, killing people, but they're fine with the other vaccines. And then you have the, the more general uh, anti-vaxxers who refuse all vaccines. Those are the very vocal people. Those are the ones that really get our blood boiling. But there's a, a section of the, of the population that is vaccine hesitant. Mm -hmm. And those are people who are on the fence. And traditionally, these are people who they might delay getting a vaccine uh, for themselves or for their kids. They might choose to get this vaccine, but not that vaccine for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And so they have this hesitancy around vaccines and they can be swayed by the scary propaganda of the anti-vaccine movement, which is very, very well funded. But they well, can also well, be swayed hang on, by hang on. I want to hold, by, So I want to stop sure. you there. And these okay. claims have been made in New Zealand and I've looked for the money and I can't find it. Who's funding this? And do we have proof of well, who I mean, is if, funding this movement? I mean, if, if you look at the, uh, the disinformation that is being spread about vaccines online, and I'm familiar mostly with the American situation, yeah. uh, but now because of social media, this spreads all over the world. Yeah. I mean, you look at somebody like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Oh, yeah. You look at somebody yeah. like Joe Mercola. I mean, Joe Mercola yeah. is worth 100 million American dollars. He is probably the most, uh, uh, the, the, the richest uh, doctor uh, worldwide. And he has been, you know, selling all kinds of supplements over, over the years, and he is very, very anti-vaccine, and writes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, articles yeah. about the, about this kind of stuff. So you have these major players who have built these empires of of disinformation around vaccines, and um, and this information trickles down on social media until you get this from your aunt or your brother. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying those people are funding it, but they're funding it by I'm shilling saying, and I'm saying, saying that send a donation. So uh, these, you know, you, there, there's a there's a very rich industry uh, of anti-vaccine propaganda. And I'm, I, I don't know where the money for diet suddenly came from. I'm not making any any yeah. inference. There. But that's some shock but, jock in the state, Sean. Someone, isn't it? Um. So the the who are you referring to? The guy who made the the diet suddenly or funded the diet suddenly. So there are two directors uh, yeah. whose names I forget. There are producers. There's Stu Peters. Uh, yeah, Stu Peters. The that's the guy. So he runs a kind right. of he kind of run an alt news site with someone called Doctor Ruby, making all sorts of wild claims. And he's clearly yeah, doing so very I, I, well out of this. I mean, he. I watched a clip of his um, uh, because they were referencing the fact that Canadian physicians. I thought, oh, okay, this is in my in my wheelhouse, Canada. Okay, what's happening there? Canadian phys physicians are just dropping dead because of the COVID vaccines. And he had somebody on his show saying, "Oh yes," and 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 they're in the prime of their lives. And so I went to the. So they looked at the Canadian Medical Association's in memoriam section. That was their their piece of evidence. And I looked yeah. at the doctors who had died just prior to the recording of dropping this, like flies of the and the yeah dropping like flies and the average age was 82 years old so prime of their life um not really Which seems so, to be again, a just, theme that if you overlook the age of the dead person you can make all sorts of claims <laughs> Um, that exactly. changed the narrative I incredibly, which is why we've got to keep asking lo those questions. Uh, are you aware at all of the case that is literally happening in New Zealand about vaccinated blood for a baby's operation? Uh, I'm not aware of this particular case, but this is something that I have seen in the news, and it's, it's not new. I mean, it's, we've seen this a lot during the pandemic, and this started with 
this erroneous claim that vaccinated people were shedding the virus, right? That we were shedding the spike protein. And so you had, uh, I mean, you had, you have references to pure bloods, to yeah, people yeah, yeah. who have not been vaccinated against COVID. Uh, you're seeing this on certain dating uh, apps as well. I'm looking for somebody who has not been vaccinated because I don't want to get contaminated. You're kidding me. Protein. I didn't realize. I don't do I'm, dating I'm not sites, kidding so I don't you. know. Yes. But now, but now it has ramifications for yeah. people who need who need. Well, well look, I think it'd be worth you looking at. So we've had a case with a four-month-old baby with a serious heart condition who had previously had a blood transfusion through the National Blood Service. They're getting public, unlike the United States, they're getting their operation. The open heart surgery for the baby is provided by um, the generous taxpayer in New Zealand. But the parents were captured essentially by two of the biggest anti-vaxxers in New Zealand in their group. And um, they said, oh, we're not going to let our baby go and have the open heart surgery that it needs right now unless we can provide blood from unvaccinated donors. So our ministry, all well, the doctors said no. This kid needs the thing now. They were last night granted the doctor's custody of the child till January the 31st, though they can provide the open heart surgery with blood that has been properly processed by the New Zealand Blood Service and the anti-vaxxers are going spare this morning in New Zealand. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that is the point where you might laugh at this disinformation uh, you might think it's a bit of a chuckle that people are that delusional, but in an instance like that, that is literally could cost someone's life. Yeah, yeah. We we often forget the the harm that comes with anti vaccine sentiment, and of course, I'm I'm very much pro safe vaccines, and we need to make sure those any any medical intervention is is safe. I mean, it's never 100% safe. Uh, there are always risks yeah. and, and benefits, but we have to know what they are to make an informed decision. But yes, there are yeah. real harms to all this anti vaccine propaganda. Yeah. Would it also be fair to say, though, to balance this, that the vaccines were developed incredibly quickly without the normal clinical trials that would guarantee a higher level of safety? And there is the possibility that there may be side effects from these vaccines which aren't so hot. So let me address this. Um, it is not true that trials were not done that should have been done. What mm -hmm. happened is that the vaccines were expedited. Uh, they were not rushed. Uh, the same way that when you pay extra at the post office, you can get your letter to be prioritized. Uh, what happens when you're running these big trials is that there's often, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of committees meeting to evaluate your proposal before you know uh, giving it the stamp of approval. And this was compressed because it was such a priority because we decided that COVID was so bad that we really needed to expedite those trials to the point where uh, the next phase of a trial might start getting pre prepared uh, before the last phase was, was done, which is a financial risk because if the results in the first phase don't pan out, then you've wasted you all this that, yeah. time and energy preparing for the next phase, which is why we don't do this normally, but it was being done here because there was such a, such, such, such a, such a, such a, a rush. And so it was expedited, it was not. Now, to, to your, your point about rare side effects, this is something that really bugs me, which is that one of the arguments that we often hear from people who are anti-vaccine is that how do we know that these vaccines are safe? How do we know that 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road, something won't, won't, won't happen? And the problem here is that we would never develop any new medical intervention if that was our thinking. If we had to wait, if we had to take this group of people, we're going to follow them for 30 years to see what's going to happen just in case something happens over that period. And then we're going to withhold the treatment from people now because we don't know. Uh, in the history of vaccine development, whenever something goes wrong, it is almost instantaneous or it is within a few weeks after the injection. Uh, and so the, the, those types of side effects, they were detected in the clinical trials. When it is a rare side effect, it is detected after uh, the vaccine or, or whatever intervention is uh, is available, and that's part of post-market surveillance. And that is exactly how, for example, the very, very rare risk of blood clots from the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, that's how this was detected, because we do have a good system of vigilance once those vaccines are out there that we can yeah. detect these extremely rare events. Would you, and I guess, uh, once again, as someone who follows this as a layperson, it did seem to me that there was an unexpected 
extraordinarily high number of instances of myocarditis as a side effect in young men that emerged as the Pfizer vaccine was rolled out? So myocarditis, I've referred to it as the, the boogie word of the pandemic. So it's right. not a boogeyman, but it is a boogie word in that um, it's this thing that a lot of people have, had never heard of before. And they suddenly uh, started focusing on this particular thing as the thing to worry about. And the thing is that you are much more likely to get myocarditis from COVID-19 than you are from any of the uh, vaccines. Right. But the people who are COVID minimalists or denialists or anti-vaxxers, they have really zeroed in. It has become a talking point of the people that spread misinformation about the pandemic is that look at this thing that you probably don't want while well, it is being caused by the vaccines. And, and that is a thing that we see throughout the pandemic is that whatever COVID-19 is causing is now being attributed to the vaccines. Uh, and we see this in diet suddenly as well. A lot of the, you, know, you see a spike in, in sort of still bursts that they show at some point. But that spike is for the year 2020 before the vaccines were available. And they're trying to tell us that it's because of the vaccines. Well, the vaccines weren't available. Mm -hmm. So we see all these side effects of, of the, the disease itself, but they don't want to acknowledge those. They want to blame all of those on the vaccine itself. Mm -hmm. It seems to me as we emerge into a post-COVID world, uh, around the globe and here in New Zealand, the masks come off, the social distancing requirements are, are removed, the mandates which caused huge issues and anger here in New Zealand are removed, even though they didn't affect many people. That the, well, the number of people who are entertaining the COVID conspiracy theories and the anti-vax theories are shrinking. But those who are left cling ever more desperately to their mis- and disinformation and become ever more strident and angry as the cognitive dissonance grabs them. How do we help those people get on with their lives? <laughs> uh, you're asking a question that, I mean, I received a lot of this kind of question um, during the pandemic from people saying, you know, I have, a, I have a member of my family or I have a friend who has been radicalized during the pandemic, they've, they've fallen down this rabbit hole and now they're profoundly anti-vaccine and we get very angry at each other and we can't communicate anymore. How do I reach this person? In fact, I wrote an article about this. It's called something like Zen or the Art of Talking to Conspiracy Theorists. Oh, okay. um, and and, uh, and, and, and it is interesting, and I, and I spoke to, uh, to Mick West, for example, who's a, who's a skeptic uh, in the United States, who has a lot of experience very calmly talking to people who believe things that aren't true and, to, and who believe grand conspiracy theories. And it's very, very difficult. Um, it's difficult because we don't like admitting that we've been wrong. Um, and it's difficult also because if you start to believe these, these things, you become radicalized, the people around you, they leave you, and then you don't have anybody left to turn to. And so the advice that I frequently heard is that if there is somebody like this in your life, try as much as possible to, to keep the relationship going um, and to change the topic of conversation. When, yeah. when, for example, when the vaccines come up, you say, you know, you know, the two of us, we disagree on this topic. Let's, what do you want to Let's for talk dinner? about something let's, else. Let's, what about those all Let's bags? talk about food. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that at some point, if they do start to have these doubts, they have somebody in their lives that they love and that they trust and that they can turn to to have these conversations. Mm. And sometimes it can feel, I, I was told, it can feel like you're, you're being unburdened because the thing is that when you buy into these grand conspiracy theories, the world is a horrible place. I mean, there are satanic forces of evil and the apocalypse is coming and it's horrible. And when you finally let go of this idea and this narrative, you start to breathe a little bit easier because you realize that the world, as imperfect as it is, is not on the verge of this giant biblical apocalypse. Yeah. Um, and that can feel very freeing. And the thing I always come back to, I've, I've got to say, Jonathan, is, oh, okay, so it's Klaus Schwab and, and Trudeau and Jacinda Ardern, and they want to depopulate the world with Bill Gates. And I always come back and say to people, why? Why would they want to do that? Kind of what's the point? You know, and well, they're not so sitting the, there with a white cat going, to, well, Mr. Bond, you know. <laughs> 
So, I mean, to, to, to uh, I guess, to argue for died suddenly a little bit, they do mention a reason, which is the, the Malthusian argument of we are running out of resources. Uh -huh. And therefore, there are too many of us, too many mouths to feed, and therefore the powers that be are trying to call the population so that we can grab all the resources for themselves. That is that is the argument that is put forth. It's in bonkers. The I'm sorry. I know I'm not meant to say that anymore, <laughs> but it's bonkers. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's funny because the part of the answer to that lies, for example, in, in genetic engineering of crops, uh, in making better use of the resources that we have. And those are the kinds of technologies that are usually opposed by people who buy into grand conspiracy theories because they're seen as being unnatural. But here we are. Hey, this has been such a good conversation, Jonathan. Um, you know, you're not a woke um, person trying to overtake the world. I think you've been so rational and, and calm. I have lost my SHIT a few times in the last week because of the sheer <laughs> pressure of these nutters uh, coming at me. So you've given me... I don't blame you, I don't blame you. You know, you've given me a little bit of room to breathe and perhaps uh, be more reasonable. Could I ask you a favour? Um, sure. Could I come back to you as the global trends of mis and disinformation when the next died suddenly start swamping my inboxes and my Twitter feed can I come back to you and see if you got some thoughts or, or can do another? And it wasn't a takedown. What you did today was a good analysis. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is what I do for a living. Um, I, you know, I write about all kinds of topics that have to do with pseudoscience and conspiracy theories and trying to make sense of all of this. And so when the next big documentary like this uh, hits uh, Twitter and Rumble, I will probably sit sit down and watch it and take notes. And I will I will write about it because unfortunately, you know, I have to find this patience in me because again, these things are harmful and they're so full of lies. I, I, I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. I mean, they're just full of lies that need to be exposed. Jonathan, thank you so much indeed for your time. That was a, an absolute, an absolute pleasure. Uh, go well, and we'll talk again soon, I hope. That was Jonathan Jarry. He's thank a science communicator at McGill University, which isn't funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, even though quite a few of you people have been telling me it is. That was a hell of a conversation, and we will talk about that later in the programme.